Fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's not full screen, but this is what we have. So three pieces of Ricci flow intuition. Um, first, can you see the equation now? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. This That's is the standard well-known Ricci flow um, equation. Uh, the right-hand side is in quotes because it's mathematical nonsense, uh, but it arises as follows. If I write out the metric in harmonic coordinates at time zero, um, I find that this term decomposes as Laplacian of G, um, where this just means um, the trace of second partial derivatives, um, and then a quadratic term in G, G inverse, and first derivatives. Um, and this um, although it's mathematical nonsense, correctly reveals that we have a diffusion reaction system. The diffusion term wants to make things uh, homogeneous and isotropic, um, but the reaction term of a quadratic nature means that there can be concentrations of curvature. Um, and indeed, this is what we see more rigorously. If you write out the PDE for the scalar curvature, you find it is a super solution of this equation. Uh, if you use the ODE comparison principle by ignoring that Laplacian term, um, then you, you notice in particular that um, if the scalar curvature ever becomes everywhere positive, um, that a finite time singularity is inevitable, you know, meaning that the maximum of the scalar curvature on your manifold, um, dealing with the compact case here so I can say maximum, um, becomes infinite. Um, and, you know, I would go so far as to say most, in quotes, compact solutions of Ricci flow um, encounter finite time singularities. A more precise statement is here. Uh, we, we have very few known conditions that would preclude finite time singularities. So generally they are what one expects to see when one studies the flow. Um, and the, the, the next statement here is possibly a little bit more on thin ice. Uh, but if the, the uh, folklore conjecture is true, um, that for compact solutions of Ricci flow, type so-called type one singularities are generic. Um, and type one simply means that the curvature blows up at the natural parabolic rate, like, like one on time to singularity. Um, if those are indeed gen um, generic, then most singularities of compact solutions are modeled at least locally by solitons. Um, technically, their kappa non-collapse shrinking gradient. Um, those details won't be terribly important in this talk, um, except to remember that shrinking solitons uh, model solutions before a singular, going into a singularity, before a singularity forms. Expanding solitons model solutions coming out of singularities. And what are solitons? Well, if you think of Ricci flow as our dynamical system, um, on the moduli space of metrics, mod, diffeomorphism, and scaling, um, then these are just stationary solutions. So they're generalized fixed points. Um, you never do analysis on this space because its regularity properties are horrible, but it's a delightful space for making definitions. So we want to keep in mind here, um, finite time singularity formation and being modeled before and after by solitons, these very special solutions. Now, um, singularities are, um, are no longer scary. They haven't been frightening for a long time. Um, Hamilton pioneered and Perlman perfected um, an approach for Ricci flows with surgery, which would allow the flow to be continued past singularities. Um, unfortunately, um, the surgeries are not canonical. And Perlman himself noticed, noticed, noted this um, in, in his first two preprints on Ricci flow. Um, and there are, in fact, four a grossly simplified version of the, of the surgery procedure. There's four key parameters. Uh, first of all, once and for all, you fix a small positive constant epsilon. It doesn't change. Um, delta of T, which D is positive but decreases in, in positive time, is the main surgery parameter. Roughly speaking, uh, it's the size of a candidate to be a neck. Um, R of T, much smaller, is the canonical neighborhood scale. Um, this is a, when the curvature is bigger than one on R squared. This means you are in a region in which the geometry and the topology are um, 
reason, the geometry is well enough understood that you have control on the topology. Um, you know, and, and, and today, thanks to some, some work of Simon Brendler, we have an even better control on the geometry. Um, you actually do surgery at a much smaller scale, like delta R squared, but this is fine. And um, then the kappa of T is, is a non we, we're, we're in dimension three. Um, or, we're, um, I am in a moment going to be specializing to dimension three um, to give motivation. Dimension three is the one case where we actually have a, a, a complete theory of, of weak solutions of Ricci flow, which is where I'm heading. So I'm being a little bit sloppy here of what holds in three and elsewhere. Most of the talk will be in dimensions five and above in contrast to three. Um, so this is this this slide is dimension three. And yeah, Mark, I should have said that. Thank you. Um, because the Hamilton and Perlman program was in dimension three. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. Um, and you know, kappa of t goes to zero as time goes to infinity because there are so, you know three-dimensional solutions um, like nil and sol that exhibit collapse. Um, and Perlman wrote in his first paper that by passing to the limit in this construction, by basically taking delta to zero, um, he conjectured that you should be able to extract a, a limit which would basically correspond to a Ricci flow with surgeries done at scale zero. So you get rid of these arbitrary choices um, and you um, get a canonically defined flow through the singularity. Um, the problem with these choices um, is that if I do surgery with, with some choices of these, Mark, and as you know, you do surgery with another choice, after the first singular time, we have no information that our solutions um, coincide. Um, they could have completely different forward evolutions after the first singularity um, without doing this limiting procedure, which was an undesirable characteristic. So um, what can we say about Ricci flows without intervening surgery um, before we get on to some beautiful work of Bamler, Kleinel, and Locke? Well, a long time ago with Misha Feldman and Tom Elman, um, we constructed a, a blowdown soliton and a, a, a flow through. So um, this is where I would draw if I had better characteristics, but we'd already lost five minutes thanks to my technical incompetence. Um, for negative time, the topology is CN blown up at the origin, and you have a shrinking soliton that does an algebraic blowdown. At time equals zero, um, you have um, an incomplete a conical metric on CN, uh, which is complete except that it's singular at the origin. Um, and then at positive time, this desingularizes um, into an expanding soliton uh, that was discovered by Huidong Zhao. Um, and at the time, there was no definition of weak or generalized solution of Ricci flow. Uh, but since these first appear in real dimension four, um, and the singular set is a parabolic co-dimension six, um, you know, you naturally want to think of these of this flow through as being a weak solution. Um, after Sigurd and I um, did precise asymptotics of the Ricci flow neck pinch, uh, we had the idea with Christine Caputo of carrying out uh, Perlman's idea of, of surgery at scale zero, um, which, which means that I still get um, invitations from robots to give talks at, at, at conferences on laparoscopic surgery. Um, <laughs> But we were able to do a regularization procedure um, and extract a Ricci flow that coming out of the neck pinch. Um, the bad news is that our uniqueness results are only local. Um, we, had, we, we critically had to work in local coordinates. We showed that any smooth forward evolution had to lie between our barriers, um, but only locally. There's no sort of comparison principle for a Riemannian metric avoidance principle the way you have for mean curvature flow. The good news is that we thought <coughs> when we started this project that we would need our precise asymptotics of the uh, um, of neck pinch form formation. And it turned out the procedure was much more robust than that. So my student, Tim Carson, was able to recover from degenerate neck pinches, um, type two singularities. Um, and then even there, more general singular initial data, which are not globally rotationally symmetric warp products, but are only so asymptotically 
um, in a uh, region close to the singularity. Um, and this will have a, a little bit of a resonance in the following slide. Um, now, when you go to the Kahler case, um, this is by no means an exhaustive list. You get a very different flavor because Ricci flow um, is a system um, that's only weakly parabolic. Kahler Ricci flow uh, reduces to the uh, a strictly parabolic equation for a single scalar function. And so classical weak solution techniques um, apply. And there's some very nice work at, at flowing forward, say, from um, uh, initial Kahler data that isn't quite smooth. This is just a sampling of some nice results. Um, I think all of these that are mentioned above could be regarded as weak solutions of Ricci flow. Um, and the dominant question of this talk is going to be under what circumstances can we expect weak solutions to be unique? Um, and uniqueness there means after the first singularity time. Okay, any questions before I proceed? All right, so let me tell you about some beautiful work in which the answer is yes. Um, so back in 2017, Kleiner and Lott introduced Ricci flow space times. Um, this is a tuple with, with four entries. Um, script M is a space time. So you crudely think of this as your spatial manifold across a time interval, uh, but that's not quite right because you've removed places where the, uh, where the curvature tensor is infinite, um, which leads to the possible incompleteness. Um, the boundary means your, your, your time can start and stop. Um, so uh, we'll work more on this in a moment. Um, T is a submersion um, that just you want to think of as the time function. It's tempting to think of this as a Morse function. That's incorrect, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, the boundary of the space time is merely the inverse image of the boundary of the time interval. So say you have a solution that eventually decomposes into spherical or S1 cross S2 components in the three-dimensional case. Um, you know, then your flow will go extinct in finite time and you'll have a, a, a two-sided boundary. Um, and DT is the time vector field that satisfies this, which says time is not a Morse function. Um, and then on the smooth parts of the manifold, um, when you restrict the space-time metric to a spatial metric, you get Ricci flow in, in, in precisely this sense, that the lead derivative of G with respect to the time vector field is exactly what it ought to be. Okay. Um, and they proved that under suitable conditions, uh, a sequence of such Ricci flows with surgery, um, where the delta, the surgery parameter is going to zero, is going to subconverge to a Ricci flow space-time um, that I say should be regarded as a weak solution of the PDE. Now, a little bit more about their procedure. Um, but first, a, a picture that I have entirely plagiarized um, from Kleiner and Lott's paper. Um, here you have the presumably most common singularity of Ricci flow, a neck pinch. So let's say in dimension three, uh, this looks like an S2 across a time interval. The S2 has, sorry, sorry toss up, spatial interview interval, the S2 has some positive curvature, so it eventually vanishes to a round point. That singular point is not in the space-time. And then afterwards, this will desingularize into two components that here look like cusps. Um, and, and, and after the, going into the singularity, it's developing at a type one rate. Afterwards, it's healing at a type two rate. These look like two little bright solitons um, that form after the singularity. And this missing point has, these points have bad world lines because they don't go back in time to the initial manifold. They only head back to the singularity, but those only develop at isolated points. So a little bit more. Um, these so-called singular Ricci flows, Kleiner and Lott analyzed smooth Ricci flow space times. Uh, they were based on compact three manifolds and positive isotropic curvature four manifolds. Um, and since I have a little time, PIC simply tells you that the only singularities that form are, um, if you do surgery at the right scale, you will see things which are asymptotically cylindrical. You won't see conical components. Um, and they imposed some additional assumptions 
um, that hold asymptotically in these cases, uh, but don't hold for the solutions that I'm going to um, discuss later. Um, so these singular Ricci flows have space-time metrics, some of the naive space-time metric you'd write down, in which case they're incomplete. You can also impose a quasi-parabolic metric, which are complete, but now non-compact. You've sort of pushed the singular um, set, which is missing, off to spatial infinity. Um, their local geometry is governed by scalar curvature. Perlman proved this in dimension three, uh, but Kleiner and Lott had to do some, some significant analysis to refine this result uh, in their case. Uh, but so what they- as, Dan, as, Dan, I didn't quite, I don't quite know what the quasi-parabolic um, it okay. It it won't be important for the talk that comes. But you you scale the metric components by the uh, by the scalar curvature, so it effectively pushes the, the singular locus off to infinity. Um, and what they really prove is a very general compactness theorem for space times whose local geometry is governed by a single function, which in this case is scalar curvature. Um, Critically for what we'll talk about later, the incompleteness in the natural space-time metric only results from cylindrical singularities. Even degenerate neck pinches, if you do the surgery in the right location, um, you'll get cylindrical limits. Um, and then in a, you know, a, with significant technical work, I think that's 80 pages, uh, Bobler and Kleiner in a beautiful result proved that singular Ricci flows are unique in dimension three. Um, we don't quite have uniqueness for the four dimensional pick case. Um, but this gives a complete and uh, very satisfying answer to Perlman's conjecture that in dimension three, um, there's a canonical weak solution of the Ricci flow initial value problem. That given a compact initial uh, manifold, you will have a unique weak solution um, for all time. Uh, for all positive time, at least until the solution becomes extinct. So what about higher dimensions? That is a refinement of the question I asked a moment ago. Um, so what can we say there? That's what's going to be coming in the rest of the talk. Um, what I'll be describing is joint work with Sigurd Anganent, um, and it touches on uh, two themes. One are potential weak solutions, uh, and one are solitons. So first of all, um, for other, other related or not work on weak solutions, McCann and Topping uh, back in 2010 introduced the notion of super Ricci flows. Uh, Carl Fredrik Storm has in a paper in 2017 on super Ricci flows. And Haselhofer and Neighbor um, have a, a probable, I guess all of these approaches are probabilistic. Uh, Haselhofer and Neighbor use martingales. Um, and they have an approach to weak solutions for n greater than or equal to four. Again, the n equals three case, I'm going to regard as solved. Um, when looking at solitons, so um, a long time ago, Tom Ivey, Robert's student, did doubly warped steady solitons, and he actually worked uh, metrics very similar to those I'm going to be studying in a moment. In fact, we borrowed um, a, a modification of one of Tom's functionals to use in our paper. Um, uh, Christoph Bem, using Lee group techniques, constructed some cohomogeneity one Einstein metrics, um, one of whom is going to pay, play a key role in uh, the rest of my talk and justifies my speaking on this at a Ricci flat conference because his Einstein metric is Ricci flat, but not flat. Um, Gastel and Kronz used a, a similar ansatz to time ivy to construct doubly warped expanding solitons. Um, and then in, in the process, we're able to do, give an analytic proof of them's original result, um, which is easier to understand if you're me. <laughs> um, I think it's probably universally easier to understand, but. And then Dan Su Helen Wong on a paper did uh, analysis of these uh, cohomogeneity one shrinkers if they exist and did some numerics, which suggested that shrinkers don't exist. Um, and I, uh, in a few slides, will be able to tell you why 
um, the numerics didn't find these, which in no sense is a weakness in their work. But okay, this is some some prior related work. Um, and then you I guess would, you, this, would, you would somehow expect that shrinkers are very rigid, unstable objects. So it's very easy to miss them numerically. Right. Um, there's no general theorem, but it's always true that shrinkers occur in discrete families um, and expanders occur in continuous families. It just, it just, it's always true. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess the, the spiritual um, grandparent of our paper is, is fattening for mean curvature flow, um, the Anganet, Illman, and Velasquez result. Um, the, the best exposition of which you can find in Tom's Trieste notes. Okay. Um, so basically, this is a Ricci flow version of fattening for mean curvature flow. Only there you're studying a four dimensional uh, ODE system, and here it's six dimensional, which um, turns out to be surprisingly harder. Uh -huh. And it's so, somehow related to spiraling behavior in the ODE about some. Yeah. Yeah. You've read ahead. <laughs> Uh, but I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, so this was a paper we completed a couple of years ago. And then this year we discovered, we just realized we proved a little more than we claimed. Um, and by adding some detail to the, uh, to our, our gluing construction, we were able to um, improve the results slightly. So let me tell you the theorem. I was in some sense, uh, well, I had the, the great privilege of working with Karen Nulenbeck for many years. And she always said, you know, don't leave your theorem to the end of the talk. So following Karen's sage advice, here's what we're going to prove. Um, so you're gonna, we're gonna have fixed two integers um, where their sum is at least four and they're, but not more than eight. Although, you know, once you're in these dimensions, you, the results hold for all higher dimensions just by crossing with a flat torus. I will explain the four in a minute. Um, I'm going to explain the eight later, but I'm going to leave you in suspense for a little while. Um, right now, n is their sum. Um, and so for any whole number k, we can construct 2k Ricci flow space times, um, which I'll describe in a moment, uh, with and without tildes, um, with associated time functions and evolving metrics. And we have the following picture. So for negative time, um, these are all the same. They're all a single shrinking gradient solitime. Um, that is to say all time slices of the space time um, are identical and they have the topology of a sphere uh, across Euclidean space. At time equals zero, the, each time slice is incomplete and again, still identical isometric to the same cone metric um, on half line, cross sphere, cross sphere. And now you know why P1 and P2 um, are at least two each because our construction requires these, these spheres to have some curvature. S1 doesn't work, okay. Um, conical singularity is removed, uh, but for positive time, um, Houston, we have a problem. Um, each of these is isometric to the flow of a distinct expanding solitime. That is to say, um, these space times are unique if and only if j equals k. And even when j equals k, in general, they're not unique uh, across the tilde. Let me explain this a little more. Um, Main theorem continued. So the Ricci flow space times we construct a maximal with respect to the natural partial ordering induced by inclusion. Um, in fact, there's only one singular time and there's only one point removed, which corresponds to the conical singularity. Um, but for positive time, uh, they're not unique, not even topologically. So without the tilde, it looks like we closed up this Euclidean factor. Um, whereas with the tilde, it looks up like we closed up this Euclidean factor. Um, so after the singularity, um, they're not even unique, not even topologically, um, you know, unless P1 equals P2. And so the, the, the conclusion um, is that weak solutions will not be unique in dimensions five and above, not even topologically. 
Um, and so in dimension three, we have this beautiful picture with uniqueness. Um, in dimensions five and above, you know, you may need some selection criteria, but in general, criterion, but in general, weak solutions can't be unique. And dimension four is, as so often is the case, a mystery. <laughs> so let me, uh, are there, are there questions? Some kind of stability criteria that picks out one in, I mean, somehow the bone things are, you know, there's an increasingly unstable family. Of right. Um, I mean, you could, when we get into this, it turns out that the eigenfunctions are hypergeometric functions, and you could possibly choose the lowest energy eigenfunction and say somehow it's the most common. Um, you know, I, I, this statement is a bit strong since we don't even have complete theories of weak solutions in dimension five and above. But you know, right now there are no known conditions that could reliably pick one out. But maybe there are by energy methods. I'll, I'll explain this more in a bit. Would it be possible to see the the previous slides a, a little longer? Just the previous one. Yes. Sure. There's a, rather a lot on this slide, and I apologize for that. So for negative time, all of these time, space times correspond, the spatial slices of these space times are the same shrinking gradient soliton. Um, this, that's, that's the one that was missed numerically that you're able to find. This is a new yeah. observation, even just this shrinking soliton. Right, and there's a, um, it, there's actually a lot of these, but they're isolated. Yeah. Okay. Um, these converge to a, a, a cone metric at time equals zero. And then going forward, uh, the cone metrics can desingularize in highly non unique ways. Yeah, I, I'm puzzled that it says that for t greater than zero, the MJs and the MJ tildes are isometric, but, but they are topologically different. I meant MJ and MK are isometric, and MJ and MK tilde mm -hmm. are isometric. I was I running out of space on the slide. No, I understand. I understand. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm confused. No, that's okay. So, without the you know without the tildes, MJ and MK are isometric. If, if and only if J equals K. With the tildes, same statement. But across the tildes, no, unless the spheres have the same um, dimension. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you all for helping my talk. Okay. So do you, I mean, do you have a picture of what this might mean in some other sort of surgery that would happen in naturally in Ricci flow in this range of dimensions? So critically, um, these singularities are conical, you know, and I think that if, if you have a condition on the curvature that guarantees that if you look at the right space-time points, you can pull out something which is cylindrical, um, I would, I won't call this a conjecture, but I would expect that you can have a surgery program um, and still get uniqueness. Uh, but without some curvature condition that can preclude the formation of these conical singularities, then I think it's um, going to be difficult to have a surgery program that could guarantee uniqueness. And in dimension four and in four dimensional Ricci flow and in significant contrast to mean curvature flow, uh, there is a conical shrinker that is expected to be generic. Um, whereas, you know, beautiful work of Colding and Minakatsi showed that among mean curvature flow shrinkers only um, generalized cylinders are generic, but Wait, that's another that statement. Yeah. So for mean yeah. curvature flow, Colding yeah. and Minakatsi showed that among shrinkers, um, the only yeah. stable ones are generalized cylinders. Um, whereas for Ricci flow, um, we expect that the blowdown soliton in, in real dimension four that I mentioned before yeah. is a generic singularity model. I wish I were able to prove that. But uh, that's a different talk. <laughs> so that, that is known to occur, but it's not a, known to be stable. 
Correct. Um, um, there's a, there's a, a paper by Huai Dong Cao, Tom Ilman, and, and, and uh, Richard uh, Hamilton going back to about 2003 or four, in which everything is correct and nothing is proved, uh, in which they come up with a, a, a notion of density for Ricci flow. Um, and, and they rank these. Yeah. And, and the next one above the blowdown celaton is Fubini Studi and, and, and Krenka proved that that's unstable. So those are your only possibilities. Okay, I have to watch my time. Now in what comes, I'm gonna be analyzing a six dimensional ODE system. Um, it felt like we made 31 changes of coordinates. It <laughs> might've been smaller. Um, I'm only gonna put up a couple of the most important ones. I don't expect you to try to follow um, these coordinate changes in real time, unless you're suffering from insomnia, in which case go for it. Um, but I wanna put up real mathematics and I will simply try to tell you what the utility of this coordinate system is without going into mind numbing detail. So um, in the minutes that remain, how does our construction proceed? So we're gonna look at cohomogeneity metrics on um, half line, cross sphere, cross sphere, where the spheres are at least two dimensional. So we have some positive curvature. Um, we're going to write uh, the doubly warped product metric in this somewhat non-intuitive way where X1 and X2 give the size of the spherical components morally. Um, we're writing it in this way because uh, we want all stationary solutions of our ODE system to, to correspond to finite values of X1 and X2. And so that's what this amounts to. Um, and we're gonna look for three quantities, metric components, X1 and X2. And because we wanna preserve this cohomogeneity one ansatz, uh, a vector field that is radial, little f of s dds, that satisfies the ricci soliton equation. So without the lead derivative here, um, you've got the well-known Einstein equation. The lead derivative gives you um, an extra degree of freedom um, that maybe makes this easier to solve. When lambda equals zero, you're in the steady soliton case that was done by Tom Ivey. Uh, lambda negative and positive correspond to shrinking and expanding solitons respectively. Um, so with a variable change, um, we're here, um, now you alpha are going, here alpha is only one and two. When we did this, we were hoping to do multiply warp products, but we got tired. <laughs> but that certainly works by analogy with them's construction. So U alpha, U one and two are corresponding, are, are encoding the size of the spheres. V is basically encoding the, um, um, the soliton vector field as well as these first derivatives. And you get this very interesting mechanical system um, that looks like a classical mechanical system with this forcing function, uh, except here the friction term could be positive or negative, and in fact is a solution of its own ODE. And we were very charmed by this when we discovered it. Um, it didn't turn out to be as useful as we'd hoped. <laughs> Maybe someone else is smart enough to use it. But we ended up studying this as a first order ODE system on R6, regarded as R5 cross R. So what does this soliton system look like? Well, we want to go back to the X1 and 2, which are, which are encoding uh, the metric components. Y1 and 2 are basically encoding first derivatives. And capital gamma is encoding V, which is encoding the vector field. And then sigma is just S squared that lets us move out of the R5 plane. There's a picture coming. Um, and now tau is log of S and prime is dd tau. And we get this soliton system. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's a, it's a first order ODE system on R6, um, which again, I'm not going to ask anyone to absorb the details of. And I'm gonna skip most of our 31 changes of coordinates. But, but here it is, um, here's the picture. Now gluing here is in quotes because we're not doing this using a, a gluing construction say in the, you know, in the sense of couple S. 
so here is the S equals zero plane, which by a standard limiting procedure you can show corresponds to steady solitons or Ricci flat Einstein metrics. Um, GF is good fill. It's the stationary solution that you get by closing off half line cross sphere to simply look like Euclidean space, the standard cylinder to sphere rule. Um, here is the Ricci flat cone, uh, which is um, smooth except at the origin. Um, and there is a unique, as we'll see in a moment, heteroclinic orbit from the good fill stationary solution to the Ricci flat cone solution, which is the BAM Einstein metric. But now once you have the cone, as long as it's Ricci flat, you can, you know, by a simple observation, any Ricci flat metric can also be regarded as a shrinker or expander. So if we allow S to become positive, um, then we can regard this solution again as a shrinker or expander with a conical end, but one singular point. Um, and so if it's a cone, you can regard any cone, a there's a Gaussian sort of soliton attached to any cone. Right. And so what we basically want to do is glue these two orbits together, um, but we don't do it with, with a gluing solution. Uh, we do it with the ODE. We, uh, what we want to look for solutions that come out of the good fill, allow S to become positive, but very small, uh, pass through this region, which when we were writing the paper, we called the meat grinder, more on this later, um, and then remain close to the shrinker or expander as they go out to infinity. Um, and so the, 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 there's a key point of analysis here in deciding which remain close, because this is very unstable for shrinkers. Uh, but there's some significant analysis to be done um, near this point for small s. So could you say what good fill meant again? Yeah. Uh, so good fill, we want to close off a half line cross sphere to be Euclidean space. Okay. Okay. Mm. You know, the standard cylinder to sphere rule. So I now want to look at closer to this point um, because Mark, as you've already- density, So the densities, so you, that, that's a lower density, that Ricci flat is a lower density obviously than Euclidean, okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, making this picture that I just drew, which will come up again in a moment, rigorous. The good fill stationary solution is a hyperbolic fixed point. It has a three dimensional unstable manifold. Um, the Ricci flat cone stationary solution is also hyperbolic with a four dimensional stable manifold. Um, we're in a six dimensional space. Um, and so these are connected by a unique heteroclinic orbit um, that is transverse in all the right places. And that corresponds to the Einstein metric that is Ricci flat. Um, that lets me speak at this conference, thanks to Robert. <laughs> and uh, um, it is the unique heteroclinic orbit from the good fill fixed point to the Ricci flat cone. Um, now, at any point in this, in, in this intersection, there's a two dimensional section sigma, which is transverse to the stable manifold. Um, and we're gonna attempt to use this two dimensional section to parameterize our potential solutions that have the behavior I tried to describe qualitatively on the previous slide. Now, now I will explain the higher dimensional restriction. When you linearize at the Ricci flat stationary solution, there's a two dimensional invariant subspace that I will describe in a moment that um, precisely for the range of dimensions between, between four and nine has complex eigenvalues. And the complex eigenvalues um, leads to a spiraling behavior that allows us to get the nine uniqueness. And I'll make that more precise uh, when coming. But, but that's why the uh, other dimension restriction is there because we need the complex eigenvalues to get spiraling behavior. So near the Ricci flat cone fixed point where we turn the corner, um, I promised myself I wouldn't use the words meat grinder in the talk, but I did. Um, it's better to look at averaged and difference variables. So the C1 and 2 are the linearizations um, near the Ricci flat cone. 
Um, Y1 and 2 are the linearizations near the Ricci flat cone because Y1 and Y2 are simply zero there. Um, C and Y are the averaged variables. Uh, gamma, again, is just the linearization of capital gamma near the Ricci flat cone. And then X12 and Y12 are these difference variables. So why would you go to this now third set of coordinates? Well, when you write out the linearization uh, in these coordinates, you get this beautiful block decomposition. Um, where this three by three matrix has nice, distinct, real eigenvalues um, that behave well for the ODE. And this two by two block um, has the complex eigenvalues and corresponds to the spiraling behavior. Um, and of course, you know, to make this all rigorous, you have to account for the nonlinear piece. Um, so this oscillatory subsystem leads to winding behavior near S equals zero. Let me say more about that um, with this visualization repeated. So the small zero spirals come in from S equals zero. So the smaller S is when you turn the corner, the more times you spiral at a significantly large, a su sufficiently large value of S the spiraling stops. So for any choice of small s at which you turn the corner, you can find finitely many larger s that came out of this region with the same cone angle. Um, and that intuitively is the source of the non-uniqueness. Um, and the smaller s is when you turn the corner, the more finite choices there are that realize the same cone values. Now, a beautiful result of uh, Lu Wang and uh, Brett Kochfar tells you that um, shrinkers are uniquely identified by their cones. So each of the shrinkers has a distinct cone, but they're getting arbitrarily close to the Ricci flat cone. Um, and, and the closer they are, the more non-uniqueness there is. So did I make that even partially clear? Okay, getting a couple of nodding faces. So, all right, we have a two-dimensional family of perturbations of the BEM soliton for S positive, but close to zero. Um, again, when we, when we go out to large S, we see these confluent hypergeometric functions that I hope I never have to work with again. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, there is a lowest eigen function. So maybe there's some, to answer Mark's question from before, there might be some sort of energy selection principle. Now, the Ricci flat cone is attractive for expanders. So we get a um, continuous, probably smooth, possibly even analytic, but we didn't prove that, two-dimensional family of complete expanders that have conical ends. There's lots of them. This is always true. Um, the Ricci flat cone is repellent for shrinkers. So only orbits that start in a four dimensional set of the six dimensional space time, uh, sorry, of the six dimensional space yield complete metrics. Um, and so um, that's why these weren't found numerically because you know, the, the initial data is a set of co-dimension two. Um, and you know, you're just not going to find that numerically. Um, but the four-dimensional set and the two-dimensional family intersect in a discrete set of points. Um, and this discrete set of points is what gives us our shrinkers. Um, when we evolve in time, each shrinker converges to a cone. Um, PQ simply uh, here is encoding the size of the two spherical components in the cone. Um, and these can be glued to, and here this is an actual gluing procedure, multiple expanders that converge down to each cone as time goes to zero. Um, and in a short while, my former PhD student, Max Stolarski, um, is probably going to complete a paper in which he demonstrates compact initial data um, that develop singularities multi, you know, modeled on these cones indicating that non-uniqueness will probably happen in the, in, the, in the compact case as well. 
Um, and so this is the source of non-uniqueness. For each cone, you get uh, finitely many um, expanders that come out of it. Uh, the smaller S is when you turn the corner, the larger the number of um, forward evolutions and the number of forward evolutions, although always finite, becomes arbitrarily large, um, indicating that uniqueness is going to be incredibly difficult. And it's now uh, time for me to say my big you know, conclusion, which I already alluded to several slides ago. Um, weak solutions should not be expected to be unique in dimensions five and above. And with that, I'll thank you and take questions. Great. Yes, thanks, Dan. It's a very interesting talk. Um, the thank floor you. is open for questions, as Dan asks. Yeah. Run. Oh, I'm off guard. Dan, you can hear me okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, I go ahead here, yeah? Yes, please. Hi, Dom. A great talk. Thanks a lot for the talk. I was just going to say, so uniqueness is known in, in the Kehler case. I was just going to say, is there a condition between Kehler and Ramanian that would guarantee uniqueness? So if you're given, if you're given so, a Kehler cone, then there's the expanding Kehler each soliton coming out of it. So it's just one then along the spectrum of... Right. So I I, I think that uniqueness probably holds for pick in dimension four. Um, the, the place where Bamler and Kleiner's proof um, encounters difficulty is one needs to analyze the spectrum of a linearized operator. Um, and when you only have in dimension pick, Singularity models in dimension three, as is well known, all have positive sectional curvature. Uh, PIC isn't quite enough to give you uh, the needed stability of the linearized operator in dimension four. And so this is really a question for, for Baumler, <laughs> I think, not me. But you know, my, my guess is there might be uniqueness there. Um, more broadly, I'll go on a limb and say if you get, if you can guarantee curvature condition that gives you um, the possibility of doing surgery of cylinders, you probably will have uniqueness. I don't expect fattening. Um, but if you have conical singularities, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be very difficult to avoid fattening. Um, and, and, and Bamler may be able to so give a better answer to this. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't expect the unique, uh, yeah, uniqueness is probably true if you have cylindrical singularities. And then, yeah, as you said, cones, you know, maybe dimension four, if there's only one cone and one expander, then maybe you're lucky, but yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> is, there, is there any reason not to try to keep cone singularities as opposed to allow them to smooth out again? I mean, I. Um, I don't think you can flow. Uh, so there, are, there are some settings like, um, you know, Lagrangian mean curvature flow, where it's natural to expect certain conical singularities to be sort of stable singularities, and then. Uh, in some cases, then you, know, you can allow those cones to, to stay as singularity. Um, okay. So I think, I think the problem is, and I'll defer to Richard here, but um, you know, let's take the mean curvature flow case and just have two crossed planes. You know, that, 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 can, that can be regarded as a stationary singular conical solution. It can, it can desingularize this way, or it can be singularized this way, um, and you know, which is happening. And, and then those forward evolutions aren't even unique. So if you admit Ricci flow solutions that are conical, that have conical singularities, how do you have a uniquely posed initial value problem? 
Um, because it seems like the solution has a number of choices for how to flow forward. No, no, I, I understand that, but I'm saying uh, in some cases, it might be a better thing to, once the singularity develops, to allow it to stay there rather than attempt to uh, smooth it out, even if there is an expander that does that. Um, hmm. Well, let me, let me say maybe dimension four, I'll imagine it. So, you know, let's say you have the FIK shrinker that shrinks to a cone. So this cone has has infinite scalar curvature at the, at the tip. Yeah. But, you know, if you, you know, just the cone itself is just, um, it's just homeomorphic to R4. Yeah. So I would expect that this is, to, you know, it's an R4 cone. So I would expect that somehow for some reason the Ricci flow would want to smoothen this out and not, not keep it a, a cone. Um, so, so in fact, I, I think you could, you could probably smoothen out this cone even without gluing in an expander just by, just by changing the link a bit to a sphere. Um, but then there are the, the other, uh, singularities that could occur if you have a, um, um, you know, if you have, what I'll talk in my, my talk about, if you, when, when, for example, you have an ALE space bubbling off. So this is not caused by an, by a shrinking soliton, but by a type type two singularity. And in this case, I, I agree. Uh, in this case, somehow the singularity looks like an orbifold and you should keep that orbifold singularity. So you should not try to resolve it. Um, so yeah, so um, so yeah, if, if, so if the cone is basically flat, then you should keep it. And if it's not flat, you should try to resolve it, I think. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Is there any chance that uh, even if uh, Ricci flow is not unique, uh, at late times it might be unique. In other words, you might be forced to encounter another singularity and make choices there. And then when you looked at what, what all happened at very late time, everything was eventually heading to the same place. Is there a chance that that would be true? Um, if, if you're very optimistic, I'll let Richard weigh in, but if you're very optimistic, um, maybe in dimension, real dimension four, um, but in dimensions five and above, Ricci flow can perform surgeries that are their own inverses. I see. Uh, so it's not clear that there's any sort of monotonicity formula in air quotes for, uh, you know, for a topological simplification going forward. You, you, you could potentially end up in this infinite loop of, of doing surgeries right, right. <laughs> that are their own inverses. I'm not saying that happens, uh, but I, I don't know of any, of any way to preclude it either. Sorry, so the, the, this picture of these things kind of accumulating close to the Ricci flat cone made me think a little bit about this, uh, uh, I guess, thing that probably Tom first proposed and then was done by gluing constructions that you know take take a round in mean curvature flow take the flat plane and a round sphere and then you know you have an increasing number of corrugations to that um is that is that a reasonable kind of analogy to think of that where you know the, the more corrugations that I have then uh the closer it looks to really this union of, of the round sphere and a flat plane. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. Okay. I, I think that that's a, that's, that's a reasonable heuristic. I mean, and, and again, in this case, um, you know, again, by my catch fire and, and Wong, um, each Shrinker has a unique asymptotic cone, but they get arbitrarily close <clears throat> to the singular guy. Yeah. But I mean, in that case, you could do it by uh, gluing, kind of knowing that they are getting close to that. So I was also, I mean, you don't need to do it in your case because you've got more symmetry, but um, uh, I mean, I, I'm yeah. wondering to what extent that, I mean, I mean, I think that's right. That's why I might just be a more common phenomenon. Um, I mean, what, what was the key property of the, uh, 
so the the key property was 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 the spiraling behavior for right and um you know in the first picture i put up i had gluing in quotes you could probably do this by a gluing procedure we let the ode do it yeah. using the complex eigenvalues and the spiraling but you could probably do it um somehow morally you know the closer your cone is to the singular cone um somehow the the large the, the more complicated your gluing construction has to be by analogy to the mean curvature flow picture that you described yeah yeah i mean it, it is very similar to the you know bone compact metrics where um somehow you have more yeah, the way that you put the the A C Ricci flat. I mean, again, you're, you know, I, I think of the morally as as a you know desingularization of this sine cone, and then um, you know you allow more wiggle, more and more wiggles uh, in the desingularization. Ronan has his hand up again. Uh... And David does too. I don't know. So yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry. Is that another question? So if you have a Ricci flow coming out of a cone, is it clear that it's an expander? So if you have a Ricci flow that converges to the cone as t goes to zero from the right, does it have to be an expander? Yes. So is there any, is there any other way to desingularize a cone? I guess that's my question. Using the flow. Um. Okay, well, uh, in general, uh, without some curvature condition. No, um, what I said wasn't a theorem, it was a conjecture. Um, but yeah, it's not known. Um, I mean, again, as Richard said, if, if the cone is flat, you just leave it. Um, I don't know of any way to desingularize a cone other than with a, an expander. That doesn't mean that none exists. Okay. That's a more precise statement. <laughs> I mean, okay. well, so what, what Ronan? Um, in yeah. in Laplacian flow, at least, then you know there are steady solitons asymptotic to G two to Ricci flat to G two holonomy cone. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know in Ricci flat, but. Uh, Alex. So uh, I was wondering. So if you if you have uh, if you have these two uh, uh, flows fitting together, you'd expect that they'd be fitting together in a smooth but not real analytic way, because otherwise, it would be uh, that would imply uniqueness. Uh, so I was wondering um, when you have a smooth but not real analytic function, it can have spiraling behavior because when you have a real analytic function, you could satisfy a Loisevich inequality, which rules out uh, infinitely long geodesic spiraling into zero points. So I was wondering if you could like put that into a coherent picture. Do we, are we seeing the spiraling behavior uh, exactly due to the lack of real analyticity? Due to a, a lack of satisfying some kind of loy savage inequality for this system? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question and I can't give a precise answer. I mean, morally, um it sounds plausible but you know i don't see it coming directly out of our proof um i mean for yeah i mean for partly because Yeah, no, it's, it sounds plausible, but I, 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 I wouldn't venture to say yes as confidently as I ventured to guess yes a moment ago. And again, my, my, my state, to be clear, my statement about, about expanders coming out of cones was a guess just because I don't know of any other choices. So yeah, it sounds plausible, but we certainly didn't prove it. Okay. 
Yeah, we, we would definitely know that the, the soliton, the space times on either side, so t greater than zero and t less than zero will be analytic. Um, so where do you, uh, did you have a, do you have a clear picture of how it doesn't fit together in an analytic way? Because uh, you have a, you have an S equals zero and it kind of flows out of that S equals zero. So that seems like a failure of anal analyticity or something. Yeah, um, technically, okay, without getting too technical, um, one can prove that the, um, the function that controls the soliton vector field um, has at most finitely many zeros, and uh, everything from the from the largest zero down to s equals zero gets squished. Now, I, I think the largest zero is probably s equals zero, but we weren't able to prove that. So that it's it's possible in in, in doing the gluing construction, um, it, it's possible that a set of non-zero measure has disappeared. Um, I don't necessarily expect that, but we were not able to figure out how to rule it out. But you know, it had, in terms of the metric, it's gone. But you know, I would, in, in terms of some non-geometric measure, it, it was there. It could have been there. I don't think it happened, but we got tired trying to prove it. Another sort of related question is question. I mean, if you, if you study the kind of end problem, um, you know, fix another conical end that's, you know, close, say, to the Ricci flat one, and then look at, say, shrinkers that are asymptotic to that end, did you ever think about that as a kind of singular ODE problem? Um, No, um, and it's an interesting question because you know you know there's at most one shrinker with that asymptotic behavior, but you don't know that there are any. Well, so I, um, so I, yes, well, yeah, yeah. Well, so I, so in in the in this G2 setting, then we studied this sort of problem, the kind of conical ends of expanders and shrinkers. And um, so what, what you see is that in our case, for instance, there's always some kind of formal power series solution. Um, and then in the expander case, then um, what you see is that those are not the only solutions, that there are other things that differ from it, but by exponentially small corrections. And that, you know, it's a bit of work to, to actually rigorously prove that. Um, on the other hand, then, you know, the shrinker case is that, uh, you know, that formal power series solution is, uh, is the unique solution, but the you know it's it's not it's an irregular singularity, and so that's not actually a convergent power series expansion, and so there is some loss of analyticity coming in 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 that case. So that may be related to what Alec is asking that you know the the problem of prescribing the kind of a cone at infinity is an irregular ODE system, even though it's a, you know, the, the coefficients and everything are analytic. Right. Um, and if you try to linearize at S equals infinity, that is uh, an irregular singular point, which is why we distinctly didn't do that. It's, it's not hyperbolic. Um, the the so function is a good thing to do sometimes. Yeah, you know, it just is hard work to do it. Um, Interesting. Yeah. The, um, so it the, explains why, you know, it gives another reason why, you know, shrinkers are much more rigid in that, um, again, you do something like shoot from a smooth, you know, you, you've got a sink, you've got a sort of smoothly closing condition over some singular orbit, and then you get some dimensional family of things from that. And then you try to match it with something coming from the cone at infinity, 
And then in the expander case, because you have these extra degrees of freedom, you've got a larger family of, of conical solutions to match with those. But uh, for the shrinkers, then you know you 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 have a you, you just have whatever family of cones you've got, and a unique one for each of those. And so again, you typically end up with discrete things because they will add up just to give you the dimension. Right. I mean, you could probably do this uh, something similar using a shooting argument because uh, you know getting down into the, the gritty details, the eigenfunctions of the linearization at the conical expander shrinker um, have the form s to the minus k, where k I don't remember, but it's some function of the dimension, e to the plus or minus lambda s squared. So when, when, when lambda is positive and you're on an expander, those are incredibly stable and you don't, you know, they're effectively zero, right? Uh, but when lambda is negative on a shrinker, those, those eigenmodes are extremely unstable. And you need some sort of a shrinking, sorry, some sort of a shooting argument that indicates that for the right starting point, none of those eigenmodes get excited. Otherwise, you go off to incomplete solutions. Yeah. Really quickly. I mean, that's also why you will never see them numerically, really. Okay. Other questions? If not, uh, let's thank Dan again for a great talk.